the Nonprofit Podcast. Tools, tips, and tactics to take your organization to the next level. The Nonprofit Podcast, powered by DonorBox. Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Jenna, Nonprofit Advocate here at DonorBox. We're here each week with practical actions you can use today to raise more money and take your nonprofit to the next level tomorrow. Nonprofits are often stuck navigating broken systems with limited resources, but we've all seen how technology can help nonprofits innovate and be more effective. Tech has changed our sector in so many ways. And today we have a great example of how technology steps in to help when systems are broken and people are exhausted. Our guest is a nonprofit founder and someone I deeply admire, an out-of-the-box thinker, a boundary breaker, a self-proclaimed nerd, and some say a disruptor. But whatever you call him, Sixto Cancel, CEO of Think of Us, is changing lives for young people in the foster care system. And in my view, is the Magellan navigating positive, timely, and much-needed change throughout the foster care system itself. Sixto, welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel like that was an introductory of like the century. So, so <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, so before we get into where Think of Us is now and where you're going, can you share how it started and why you have such passion for and are such a champion of the cause? Absolutely. My Passion for the cause starts with my own lived experience in foster care. When I was 11 months, I entered the foster care system and got to live with my biological mother between six and seven, but unfortunately was back in the foster care system at seven. And I found myself adopted at the age of nine, but it was a pretty racist and abusive adoption. So by 13, I was couch surfing. And it took a lot to get back into foster care from that situation. I had to record the abuse. I had to really journal what was going on. And finally, when I had enough evidence, I finally was able to get back into the system at 15. And that's when I realized that the system was broken. I wasn't angry because it was a failed adoption. It was much more about the fact that I felt like I was being called a liar for two years, right? I felt that um, there was no clear pathway for me to be able to say, here are the things that are happening to me and be believed. And so when I came back in, I thought it was going to be like the end of that storm, but it was just the beginning of the next storm. And I had to go to several foster homes. I had to figure out different bureaucratic processes to get what I needed, like clothes and so forth. And so I became passionate about how is it that you change the actual foster care system? I want to thank you for sharing your story and um, the transparency that you have when you are sharing it. Um, I think it helps people to um, kind of step into that space and imagine what that's like to really rally behind the cause. And it really, it highlights your leadership. And um, I think it really highlights um, how you're leading Think of Us now. And that's what I'm really looking to understand today. I want to understand more about the driving force behind your leadership style. I would say the driving force behind leadership style is really the data. And in particularly what I call lived experience data. And this is data that comes from people who are most impacted by the problem. Every time we share our stories, share the nuances of our pain, of the things that we have been through, it allows us to understand better as people who are working in the system, people who are working on the system, to really understand where can you make those improvements. And so when I think of what fuels us to move left or right, it's about how do we understand the stories of thousands and thousands of people who have this collective experience um, engaging with the system, but that there are so many nuances on how the system needs to be able to respond and be different. Absolutely. So you mentioned really, um, really briefly their um, lived and learned experience. Would Would you say that your approach to what you're doing has come from lived experience, learned experience, or both? I would say that our approach is around lived experience. And I think that as a society, we've had figured out that the lived experience of a particular person in creating a product or service is very important. 
But what we haven't yet figured out really, and I think we're all on a journey on, is how do you do lived experience at scale? How do you have enough lived experience data, enough data from thousands of human beings to constitute a national or state level intervention? Yeah, absolutely. And um, that leads me, actually, that's the perfect segue into my next question for you. I do want to talk about um, kind of collecting that data and your choice to go with tech, right? So I've heard you say just now, and I think I've also heard you say in a tech talk that I watched, um, that it was learning that you had to be able to prove your cause against the system as a team that opened your eyes to the potential of technology as a way to disrupt this entrenched foster care system way of doing things, right? Of only providing food, shelter, rather than looking at developing those healthy, well-rounded um, human beings. And so you chose to go with tech and you've hinted towards a little bit, um, a little bit towards why you chose to do that. But I think especially for a lot of nonprofits, they stray away from tech, right? Um, and from that data, because it almost seems counterintuitive on like an emotional level using tech kind of cold and analytical right to create this human connection but you've done that um so what what made you realize that's the way that you needed to go well one of the things that made me realize this was that when i first started think of us what i simply just wanted to do was create a website where there were videos for other young people to understand what to do before they aged out and then as I was on that journey, I realized that we needed much more. Um, we actually needed, it wasn't it, this problem about aging out, turning 18 or 21 and having to be completely on your own, that you can have all the information in the world for that moment and yet still not be able to thrive because we need humans around us who are like family to guide us in those in those big moments. We need a place to live. We need to be connected to work and school. And so what I realized was that um, young people needed more of that. And what they needed was voice and choice and what was happening to them during their high school years so that they could be prepared for life after high school. And the first idea I had um, in 2011, you know, uh, it had only been a few years uh, since there were apps available. And so how was it that we can create an app that would allow a young person to build a personal advisory board that would guide them in getting prepared for life after high school and work with the system to do so? What we learned in that process was that that generated a lot of data and we could see different biases in the back end. While we were testing and prototyping, we could see that certain folks leaned more towards recommending that young people would go ahead and um, be on an educational track. Or we would see that people would go ahead, workers would, some workers, some groups of workers would go ahead and recommend um, young males before females for an apartment, even though young females were actually much more financially stable and had larger saving accounts, right? And so we could see these biases in there. And that's when we realized that there's another, another usage here. There's a usage of lived experience data that's produced by young people, by the actual constituent to actually inform what you should be doing programmatically and in, in, in at a system level. That's amazing and um, really exciting. What I want to ask is, so you you almost made this sound, um, and I know it wasn't too easy, like this natural transition from the cause that you're rallying behind to moving into this app, which like you said, up until that point, like how long had apps really been around? So um, I think I understand a little bit about how you went about starting, but how did you build a community of people around this initiative? Something that's totally brand new to understand these nuances within the system. Well, in the beginning days, it was not easy. In fact, I went over to the community, I was in college and I walked over to the community, the computer science department and I tried to recruit folks and I totally, utterly failed um, in being able to recruit people who were developers um, because of the things, the, the options that people in that department had. And so I asked myself, who else knows how to code? And at the Virginia Commonwealth University, there is a, a, a major called kinetic imaging. And this is how you can use, part of it was how you can use code to actually turn around and create different art, right? 
And so I went there and I recruited art students because I felt like, one, they were passionate about the causes I was passionate. Number two, they had a baseline of coding. And number three, uh, they could teach themselves because our students will stay up all night teaching themselves all types of things. And so our prototypes were, you know, the first uh, prototypes that we came out of this organization was definitely um, built by those of us who a lot of people who are either in political science or a lot of people who are in the art school um, and then launch from there. I love that. Um, I, I think that it's very resourceful. And I think it's also important to highlight that, you know, trying and failing is a part of launching tech. And um, once you find those people to get behind the initiative, it can work out in a really beautiful way. Uh, so this is a message to our nonprofits who are listening to this podcast. Once we publish it, don't let the idea of failing scare you away because it can turn into something really, really impactful. So thank you for that. Um, I would love to learn more about uh, your app, the services uh, that you're offering and how exactly you connect foster youth to um, mentors and uh, people, you know, creating a circle for them. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So when we rolled out, we had a lot of learning lessons and I mean, learning lessons around what happens when you put a young person, their network of support, adult supporters and a system on one app, it's called tension. (laughs) And there were a lot of tension. Um, We were able to learn things such as who young people were relying on. And eventually what we decided to actually pivot the organization from being a software tech nonprofit to a systems change nonprofit, because what we realized is that this was not a technology issue. You know, young people having voice and choice in their treatment plans and their case plan where they live, that we actually need to change the actual design of the system and who has the power to do that. And so we reallocated our resources, we restructured, which was one of the hardest experiences that I've been through as a CEO to really make these hard and, you know, plant your stake in the ground to say, actually, we're transforming. Um, and so we made that move and it was catalytic, very painful during that time. But today we are now an eight million dollar, uh, you know, a year organization, 40 full time people. And by leveraging simple tech and the technologies that we did develop, we were able during the pandemic to actually find over 30,000 young people and be able to connect them to their pandemic relief funds. Um, that were specifically for foster care that we helped pass. And and, and we're talking over $60 million. That's incredible. So it it sounds like you knew kind of right away that it would take more than just alerting people to the problem and that you could now prove it through the platform. So were you always aware that you would have to kind of be, I I can't think of a better word than disruptive, um, be disruptive in this space in order to get the attention of these people um, to um, make these changes and to build such a strong organization? I think, you know, I'll back up to the piece around um, making people aware. I think that, you know, for those of us who are running nonprofits, for those of us who have lived experience with any type of trauma, you know, the level of injustice that one experiences and how wrong it feels when very bad things happen to you. There's this notion and this belief that only if the world knew how unfair or how painful or how bad the situation is, that they would act. And I used to operate under that premise for a long time. But what we learned was that actually that's not the biggest um, driver and motivator for a government system to be able to act. Because at the end of the day, the system, the bureaucracy cannot love you. And it needs evidence for why it should do something differently. Those are some really powerful words that kind of cut deep. I think that's, you know, just not only a big realization, but just kind of a big proclamation to, I mean, what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I so appreciate your your mindset and your insights there. So um this is this is a huge question for other change makers uh, similar to you and organizations in similar situations. Um, prob- probably just dealing with a dis- different type of systemic failure. 
how do you gain access to people who can actually affect policy change? You know, I think the number one thing that people who are working in policy need is proximity, is to understand what are the problems that are happening on the ground. And if you are a vessel to be able to bring people closer to that um, and give them evidence that allows them to make choices, you know, they come to the table. People do not sign up to be in political appointees um, and you name it um, because it is a very lucrative, uh, uh, you know, job. The people who are doing the work, who are literally handwriting, who are writing those policies, who are having to make those tough calls, these are folks um, who tend to operate with a deep mission and a belief and want to know. I do think sometimes there is fatigue that we do see from some of these folks, too, so I don't want to, you know, glorify too much here. Um, but the reality is, is I think that my number one advice to people would be to be able to be a bridge between those who are making decisions and the evidence that's needed to make those decisions that are coming from enough people who are experiencing that challenge. And this is very important because to do that well, you have to understand the multiple different experiences within that particular challenge um, and in that particular collective experience, and yet enough of the nuance that you can lift up for those folks. Absolutely. So um, can you tell me about the first time you lobbied and where, who, and what your approach was and how you felt about the outcome? I'll tell you about two experiences. The first experience was when I was in uh, I was in high school and I didn't realize I was lobbying, but I was just telling my story that a state advocacy organization asked me for around being connected to siblings. Unfortunately, I had um, been separated um, from my siblings going into foster care the second time, and that meant I didn't see any of them for eight years. And so that really weighed heavy on me. But the time that I intentionally understood what I was doing was when I was coming into college, um, my first couple of years of college, I got to participate in a campaign and it called Success Beyond 18. And this campaign was about extending foster care. It was about centering young people in their case plans. And what was so powerful about this particular moment um, was that I didn't, it wasn't just about the panels or the presentations. It was about having intimate moments um, with congressional staff, with congressional people, and being able to explain what is this, and then being able to say it's not a unique story. And that's the hard part for people. When you realize that there's such an injustice or something is broken so bad that it's not a one person story, but that you have hundreds of thousands of people experiencing that same thing. That's really powerful. And um, I appreciate you sharing that. So thinking about, you know, accidentally lobbying, lobbying and planning to, how has that developed for you for Think of Us? What do you consider to be your greatest, greatest achievement in policy change um, that Think of Us has spearheaded or helped drive to date? And I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Sorry. Not a problem. I think the greatest thing that we've been able to uplift is not the particular policy or, or legislation, which I can speak to, but it's actually the concept. The concept across three administrations um, that we should really be incorporating lived experience. And so during the Obama administration, we got to do a little bit of that through hackathons. And we did a hackathon at the White House, bringing together young people, technologists, and people of the system to propose uh, to propose new solutions. And there were direct products that were created out of those proto prototypes of that hackathon. But there was also regulation. Um, and what the uh, uh, the commissioner at the time, uh, the assistant commissioner at the time, um, who was Rafael Lopez, was able to do at that time was actually pass regulations that have led to over a billion dollars and funding to states to upgrade their systems. During the Trump administration, you know, we were able to bring lived experience folks um, to talk to the Associate Commissioner of the Children's Borough and really say, here are the needs that we're having during this pandemic. And we had national town halls. Um, people were mobilized because of this unison. And at a time where there was so much division, there was unity when you brought people with the actual lived experience of aging out, of being a, a homeless, of not being able to be employed during this pandemic. And that administration still took action. And this administration has gone even further 
um, during the Biden administration to ensure that they're hearing from lived experience folks every other Friday on a youth stakeholders call. And so for me, I am deeply moved by the contribution that we have been able to have towards understanding how, when, where, and the importance of centering lived experience folks in your decision making in how you move forward. And the reason why I say contribution is because it's not just us. But the collective we has made it so that folks understand why we should go in that direction. That's incredible. I You kind of jumped over to something that I wanted to ask you later. So we'll get back to it. But um, I just want to note that this is really showcasing like being an agent of change and also making sure that everybody's being heard and included and um thinking about being a think tank agency to a policy change agency to highlighting that that lived experience sounds like you're doing it all uh but what i want to ask is thinking about this journey and um all the big things that you've accomplished and that are um ongoing what is the end goal for Think of Us in this journey? Well, we want to go ahead and re-architect the foster care system in partnership with the ecosystem. I believe that today we can. there is a clear path to shift a couple of things. Number one, it's that there is a group of young people who are in the foster care system who don't belong in the foster care system. This system was created for abusers. And unfortunately, what we have is 64% of the young people who are here who have experienced neglect. And a lot of those neglect places have to do with poverty. And if we have more solid interventions that help a family, then we can go ahead and keep that family together. And so 2018, there was a new mandate that was given to child welfare by Congress to go ahead and prevent unnecessary young people entering the foster care system. And so states are literally right now starting to begin that work. And then the second thing is that if you do have to be in foster care, that we will prioritize you being placed with family or the people that you know. Today, only 33% of young people are placed with a family member or someone that they know. And what we know is that when you place with family, you have better outcomes. For example, 67% of uh, foster youth who are placed with a family member graduate high school on time compared to 35% of young people who are placed in foster care and are at a group home, right? And so we don't have to separate families. We could do a better job. We believe we can get to 80%. The last thing I would say is that if you are a teenager who's been impacted by foster care, um, even if you go back home, that I believe we should be doing as much as possible to make sure that you're ready for life after after high school and that you're connected to work or you're connected to school, but that you are able to be in a pathway where you're able to be self-sufficient in the future. And that that is the responsibility when you have had this type of intervention by the government. So something I want to ask you, and um, you've talked a lot um, about the work you're doing and the stats and uh, the things that people should know. So if there are any potential supporters listening to this podcast today, what is something that they need to know um, where they can help, how they can impact this community, how they can help, um, you know, further this mission um, beyond just um, the policymakers that make those big decisions? Um, Can they be a bridge? Um, Can they educate others? What is the best, um, you know, plan of action for them? So number one thing I would say is that um, we are a hidden population and there are so many people who have taken in a relative um, and that is called kinship care. And so we, when we say foster care and when we talk about the system, we limit it to a smaller group of folks, but who we are making policy for and who we really want to continue to push forward is not just those who are in foster care, but those who are in what we call kinship care. Um, we believe that policies should reflect you know, a more equitable um, support for people who take in their relative, for example. Um, Right now, in many states across the country, if you are grandma, uncle, aunt, sister, brother, and you take in a relative, you're not getting that $800, um, you know, national average of support that goes to a foster parent. And so the government is willing to pay a stranger than a relative to provide care. And when we can see that care from a relative is much more impactful, like the numbers show that it's very impactful. And so what I would love for everyone to do is start to self-identify 
because we don't know how many people who are actually taking care of a relative. The second thing I would say is to definitely donate at our, you can find us online at thinkof-us.org. Um, and the last one is that as we get prepared into the next year, um, mid to late next year, we are going to need people from all parts of the country to really be helping us, you know, express the importance of our issues to people who are working in Washington, D.C. And so we uh, educate. We do not lobby. And so we will need people to help us educate their members about what are these issues that um, are happening right in their backyard. So. Being that disruptive agent of change, I know I've said this many of times, um, how do you make sure that everyone is heard and included in this big conversation? Because this is a really, this is a big conversation. Yeah. So one of the ways that we make sure that people are heard is like, we have done things like create a Google Doc and share it with over 80 organizations and say, look, we're about to go to the White House and we're about to have this conversation or we're about to talk to this congressional person. We would like, you know, your thoughts. And we have this running live document of over 50 pages of the meetings that we've been to and how what will have been our talking points. And I believe that that actually, you know, causes a level of trust. Um, between folks to be able to go ahead and understand what are we saying to the world and then what are we doing. The other thing that we've done is that we've been able to issue uh, grants, cash grants to young people. And we've had over 27,000 young people who've actually applied to our cash grants. And from that data, um, with you know, we were able to say, oh, well, these are young people's actual priorities. How might we lift that up and how might we push that forward? And so we're always finding ways to kind of crowdsource, to understand what are people saying? Uh, and most importantly, how do we center the experience that that person who we're trying to impact is having with us? And maybe one final question for you, or perhaps two. Um, we talked a little bit about um, technology and utilizing it to um, open up all this, this whole new level of knowledge beyond data, and it goes into a deep understanding of, you know, the impact that you can have. What would you say to um, a nonprofit leader um, thinking about using tech um, to serve their community um, that may be afraid to dive into that realm? Any words of wisdom or um, any bravery that you can impart there? When thinking about going into using technology, one of the most important things that I would say is for folks not to overcomplicate it. So we immediately go to what developers, what language, what stack, what database, all this stuff. When in reality, that simple tech is some of the most powerful tech. So there are already things that have been created like Typeform, like Google Forms, and being able to have the orientation and the culture of saying, how do I use that technology? How do I evaluate that data? How do I get insights from it? Like that's the actual magic power here. It is not how fancy or how expensive the tooling that you're buying is. Don't overcomplicate it. I love that, thank you. And finally, maybe one last question for you. Is there anything else you would like to share about the work that you're doing? Maybe anything upcoming, uh, any big goals for Think of Us in the, um, well, in the rest of Q3 and Q4? What I'll share is that um, we recently launched our Center for Lived Experience and we want folks to check it out. We are in the middle of figuring out how is it that we continue to center lived experience at scale and how others can be doing that in their sectors because foster care lives at the center of so many different systems. When you are a, a parent who um, is struggling with housing, it is so difficult to be able to go ahead and not be brought to the attention of child welfare. And when that happens, your child might be taken away. If we had a stronger housing intervention, we've seen something different. If we had stronger substance abuse interventions, it would be different. We actually need our counterparts in different systems to be able to center their lived experience in creating their systems and improving their systems so that we could all um, rise together. Thank you, Sixto. Um, this has been a really great interview. I love 
listening to you talk, uh, sharing your wisdom, sharing your passion, um, sharing your unique perspective on how you approach things. Um, to be honest, I don't think I've met any um, leader of a nonprofit that thinks quite the same way you do um, when it comes to this beautiful marriage between that lived experience and the data and um, centering the community and policymakers and um, educating and um, hearing everybody's voices within that. Um, you're doing an amazing job. You're doing great work. I'm so appreciative um, for everyone that you're serving and all the lives that um, think bus is changing through their work and, and beyond. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I so appreciate you. And I've really enjoyed this and I cannot wait till it comes out. Six Do Cancel is many things, inspiring, motivational, caring, catalyzing, but he is so much more than a disruptor. He's a truth teller. By speaking truth to power, he and Think of Us are leading the way into a data-driven future that isn't sterile or lacking humanity, but rather one that is anchored in lived experience, reflecting the reality of the community it serves, and establishes a metric-based route to positive change, which in turn drives donations. Using data-driven fundraising, nonprofits can look at past successes and failures to better understand what may work with their donor base. Marketing, advertising, and the big ask all depend on what you know about your donors. And the technology available online to unlock those insights is simple, inexpensive, or sometimes even free. When you look at what Sixto and Think of Us have achieved with their deft use of data, integrated with the lived experience that forms the core of their work, you can see how the future opens up, certainly for strategic organizations who embrace tech, but more importantly, for the communities they serve. Sixto's right, simple tech is the most powerful tech. If you take nothing away from this discussion other than that very profound truth, you're already winning. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to download and review the Nonprofit Podcast today or give a thumbs up to the Nonprofit Podcast on YouTube. Your review is a great way to help others find us. You're here to help others. We're here to help you. Until next time, stay inspired. The Nonprofit Podcast, powered by DonorBox, helping you help others.